Now, that used to be European matters, which where the regulations were coming down from Europe, will now become international matters. We will have some deal with the European Union. Even if we have no deal, the day after no deal, we'll be back in Brussels negotiating what a no deal looks like, because they're still there. We, we, we know there's going to be some kind of arrangement. There'll also be free trade deals with other countries, Many of these will cover devolved matters. They'll no longer be dealt with at the European level. So where does Scotland fit into that? What is Scotland's role there? Uh, and there have been negotiations going on around this which consistently avoid facing up to the issue of principle. And I've been at many of these meetings. So the UK government came up with lists and lists of competences. There was 154 and then 73 for Wales and stuff in Northern Ireland excruciatingly working their way through things where you might have to have some possibility of Scotland having an input. And separately, another process going on saying we try to define what the UK internal market means and what the implications of that might be. And then a third process about intergovernmental relations, none of which have gone anywhere at all because the position of the UK government has always been we will always have the last word, this is not a federal system. Now that's always been there in the devolution settlement, but we managed to work our way uh, around it. It didn't really matter much for 20 years, uh, and Europe dealt with a lot of these issues. So this exposed a, a, a deep fault line in our constitutional settlements in relation to Scotland. I could talk about Northern Ireland, but I won't, but it's even worse there. The problems are, are, are even worse there. Uh, and the, the way that Scotland fits in. So suppose if Brexit happens, then the question will arise, how can we rethink Scotland's place in the United Kingdom in respect of domestic matters, but also in respect of foreign matters? And here's where Scotland and the world and Scotland and Europe comes in. Because the way to Europe will be then through the UK government. How do we ensure that the UK government doesn't sign international agreements without getting the agreement of Scotland? They say they will consult. That's different from getting uh, agreements. And then it raises the whole question of how Scotland will operate in Europe on its own uh, after Brexit, because there are still multiple opportunities for getting involved in European networks and European policies using devolved powers. Now, as I said, I hope we'd have something to say about that after three years. Uh, we, we, we simply don't. The energy of government is absorbed just in getting Brexit uh, on the road. Uh, what is really worrying is that because there's no time to talk about these issues of the Constitution and entrenching Scotland's constitutional position, they're being put aside, precedents are being set, the Sewell Convention about not legislating in Scottish matters has been set aside. And if we're not very careful, we could end up with Brexit involving not a power grab, because Westminster's not really interested in grabbing powers from Scotland. They're not really interested. But nevertheless, a loss of power and a loss of capacity by Scottish uh, institutions. Uh, and Brexit meaning return of power, not just back from Brussels, but power to Westminster. So the two are, are, are deeply connected. And to conclude, all I can say is I don't have an answer to that, but I'm very worried about the implications of all of this. <laughs> diversity going of speaking arrangements. If I can stand up here and you can, can you still hear me? Yes, keep nodding at the back, which is always a good, a good sign. Well, um, just, just let me add my welcome again to, to Felix's and thank you for coming to our joint event. Um, we, we decided at the start of the year that we were going to do this report on, on the future of Europe and, and I thought at the time it was quite a rash thing to do, not that there are, isn't lots to do and say about the future of Europe, but I thought if we try and think about the future of Europe and whether Brexit happens or not, and which sort of Brexit happens or not, and whether Scotland goes independent or not, whether in response to that, you know, we'd end up with about 20 scenarios that would all be about Brexit and or independence. Um, and I thought, can we start with the future of Europe? Because these big issues are there, whether we're talking about climate change or divisions in Europe or where the Eurozone goes next or migration or inequality. 
those issues are still there, and Brexit, as Michael was just saying, so drained a lot of the energy and attention from anything else um, that we've not been discussing them. So that's what we've done in this report. <coughs> we've tried to look first at the big future of Europe challenges, and then we asked all our wonderful and excellent authors, uh, three of whom I've got on the panel with me tonight, to look at that first, and then to look at what Scotland's contributions and interests are in that particular area that they were writing about. And, and see what you think when you look at the report, or some of it, I hope you will, online, or take a copy. But I think it's a very constructive and creative way to think about to think about that at the moment. Because Brexit, to me, is very important. I've, I've been passionately arguing that we can and must still remain, that we should have a people's vote and have, a, have another go. And may, maybe, and hopefully, we won't leave. But I think we can't allow all our energies to be absorbed into that. There's an awful lot else going on in Europe and in the world, and we will still be a European country here in Scotland. Even England, like it or not, will still be a European country, in fact, even if it's not an EU member state. So that, that was some of what motivated me um, in, in, and us in, in, in getting this project going, and that this report is just very much a first stage, I, I would say. Um, but I'm not going to do anything as rash as try and summarise all that in four minutes or summarise all the challenges facing Europe in four minutes. Um, but let me say something about the challenges facing Europe and then conclude with a few comments on Scotland's contribution um, and interests in that. I think it's, it's very easy to be very gloomy at the moment, you know, we see UK politics in, in chaos over Brexit. We, Europe may look a bit healthier in comparison, but, but we read a lot about divisions, we worry about the state of democracy and the rule of law in countries like Hungary and Poland, where the media or the judiciary or both have been under attack. We, we look at the, still now, four years later, the political, short-term political responses in Europe to the migration challenge and the, the number of refugees that came especially from Syria in 2015. Um, where I always try and remember that Europe actually at that point took in a million or more refugees, it, uh, but it was then later that it divided and split and became, in, in my view, somewhat more reactionary or <coughs> reactive in, in how to, to deal with it. Um, and the, looking to the world as a whole is, is not looking as stable maybe or as hopeful a place as it might have been a few years back. We've got President Trump creating <coughs> arguments in lots of different directions, trade wars with China, very serious worries over Iran, um, pulling out of the Paris <coughs> climate agreement. So yes, it's a, it's a changing and it's a, a difficult moment, but it's also, for me, it's therefore clearly a moment where we need international and European cooperation. We cannot do these, deal with these things on our own. Um, isolationism and Brexit is just one example of isolationism is not the answer. Um, and I also think we always, when, when, when the times are tough and there are lots of challenges, as well as looking for solutions to those challenges, it's very important to remember some of the positives and some of the strengths. So the EU may not be where we want it to be on climate change, for instance, but nonetheless, it's ahead of a lot of other countries in the world. And I also, when you see the school strikes, or you see a lot of discussion about Green New Deals and, and ways we need to step up to a net zero carbon future, I think there's a lot of scope and hope to push the EU in that direction, and that sense of urgency that we've needed but has been lacking is coming. So I think we have to see the good with the bad. Same, for instance, on human rights. The EU has long prided itself on being a human rights leader, and it's very easy and it's very important to criticize the EU when it fails on that. And, and we can see in the midst of the migration challenges the way you, the EU has failed, whether it's working with the Libyan Coast Guard, um, it, and it, in ways that have been, you know, the way Libyan detention centers are run has been condemned by Human Rights Watch and other, other groups, or if we look at the, the conditions in some of the, the refugee camps that still exist in Greece that took in some of the, the migrants and asylum seekers from 2015, then we should be very ashamed of that. 
but at the same time, let's you know not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, so I think when we look at some, yes, there are divisions in, in the EU. Yes, there's been a lot of concern about lack of solidarity. Yes, we're right to be worried about the growth and support for especially right-wing populist parties, and we'll see how well they do in the European Parliament elections in a couple of weeks. But on the other side, on the other side, they're not going to be in the majority. We are still going to have mainstream, more mainstream parties in the majority in Europe. And I think Europe, even in times of crisis, has, has always had that habit sometimes muddling through rather than being very strategic, and I think we're at a moment where we need strategy, perhaps around a Green New Deal, um, but I think we shouldn't translate, for instance, the UK's Brexit crisis, which really is a crisis, as reflecting that level of, of political breakdown and incoherence, at least, um, in the EU, and I think it, I think it doesn't. And, and when it comes to Scotland, yes, Scotland is very much, as all the polls have shown, a Remain country. We voted 62% Remain three years ago. <coughs> I've been the polls since then. It's more like 67 or 68%. I think it's very interesting if you look at Remain supporters by, by voting intention. You'll find levels over 70 or even 80% support for Remain among Labour, SNP, Green, Lib Dems. So it's something that crosses the pro-UK or independence divide. Um, and Michael was very interesting and it's absolutely crucial, this question of what's happened to devolution and powers. But one of the things we go into in this report is to say, what about so-called soft power? What about something called para-diplomacy? Can the Scottish government and can Scottish actors, whether universities or NGOs or others, business unions, think about a more coherent, a more overarching strategy for Europe in devolved areas and not in devolved areas. Um, what would that look like? It would surely build on some of Scotland's and the Scottish Government's good work on climate change, on giving a positive lead on migration, because Europe certainly needs that. Europe's actually facing a huge demographic challenge. We need to face down the populace, not build a, a fortress Europe. Um, I'm sure we can find areas in, in Scotland in terms of human rights to criticise, but, but we've also seen a lot of work going into setting Scotland up as a potential role model on human rights, especially on economic, social and cultural rights. Um, Scottish Government and others, Green Party, not only pro-independence parties, really interesting in trying to think what an inclusive Green New Deal can be and a, on a much more specific level in the last year or two, the Scottish Government has actually set up new so-called hubs in Berlin, in Paris, in Dublin, to add to the existing Scottish Government office in Brussels. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to end there. I think, yes, there are big challenges facing Europe. We're in a very critical time at a moment when, as I say, the rest of the world is not looking as stable or as pro-multilateral democratic paths as, as you might want. But we, we have to see what are the positive strategies through that. And Scotland's just one small country amongst many other small European countries. But I think all together we need to have that discussion, keep those networks going, develop the European strategy, hopefully in my view defeat Brexit, but either way continue to contribute to that European future. Thank you. very much for your reflections, Jesse, which managed to take us kind of out onto the meta level and also um, have uh, relevance to us here in Scotland. Um, our final speaker this afternoon is um, Paul Reddish, and he's our, he's our voice for civil society, so we have the platform. <laughs> well, I'm going to try and cover a few things that, that are maybe a symptom of Brexit, but then try not to talk about Brexit, which is quite difficult. Uh, I may get drawn back to it one or two times, but let, let's focus on some of the bigger issues that, that maybe have led us to this point and some of the positives as well. Um, in my chapter, I focused on engagement with young people in, in particular. Um, and if you look at young people's um, engagement with, with Europe and, and what Europe has done for young people, um, there is an argument in a lot of areas to say that young people have benefited 
hugely compared to other populations, uh, particularly around employers and workers' rights, the minimum wage, um, social mobility, the Erasmus programme. There's some fantastic examples of where Europe has led uh, opportunities for young people, um, uh, either improving their rights or giving them access to things that they might not otherwise um, engage with. Um, and at a macro level, if you talk to young people, um, uh, and, and by young people, the, the survey I'm talking about here, between the age of 16 and 24, um, nearly two thirds of young people in the UK would consider themselves global citizens first, um, as opposed to citizens of a particular country. Um, you know, they're engaged in global issues, they're interested in things like climate change, they're interested in you know, working and collaborating, and that's, to some extent, a symptom of the environment that we've created. Um, and yet, um, we find ourselves here um, with, you know, if you ask, um, you know, various surveys on it all are in favour, but around 80% of young people are <coughs> broadly positive about Europe as opposed to negative, yet turnout at the last European elections was less than 20%. Okay, and this comes to the root of the issue. Um, um, if we're to really tackle um, some of the challenges we've got in Europe, we have to start engaging citizens. Um, we can't do things to people uh, without involving them in the start, giving them a voice, giving them an opportunity to shape things. And I don't just include Europe in that, I include Scotland and I include the UK. Um, there are um, examples throughout our society where we you know, just look at obvious things where we've got it wrong. Um, the age of criminal responsibility is 12, yet yeah, it's another six years before you can vote. So there are inconsistencies across the way we treat young people everywhere in our legislation. And the single biggest democratic thing that people can do, it's quite simple, is the oldest age compared to all the other things that are punitive. And, you know, it's these simple things that we've built into the way we engage young people. Um, that I think is often at the root of, of, of their engagement for us, or in some, some instances they're thought that they don't necessarily have a voice or an opportunity to engage and influence things. Um, and I think that at the heart of it is, is the opportunity. Um, and you know, if we're to learn anything from, from this process, if, if you've got 80% positive engagement, how do you get the 20% vote up? Um, and that can't be just by doing things that help people because we've been doing that since the European project started. <clears throat> and I do think if we're to engage more people in the European project, the benefits of it, um, and really build this back up, then you know, we have to involve people from the start in policy making. Um, and that includes young people, it includes people in communities, um, and it includes the 99.9% .9 of the population that don't feel they have a voice, and that the issues that they face are actually really simple micro ones, and they want someone to listen, they want to understand how someone's going to help them address them. And in a way, that is linked to the rise of populism, because in, in feeling helpless and in feeling that nobody's listening to them around those issues, people are then feeding off that helplessness and then, and then feeding the outrage. Um, so, they, you know, it's all there, um, you know, and there's, there's so much hope um, with that message around young people's positive engagement, and yet um, we continue to create an environment where they can't engage with us. Um, and I think that's our single biggest challenge if we're going to a lot that particular group. Uh, we have started to do that quite well in Scotland, and I mean started, we're on a long journey here. Uh, and actually, I said I wasn't going to, going to mention Brexit. I, I think in um, Scotland's relationship with Europe going forward, there are some really innovative, smart things that are happening in Scotland at the moment that you know we should be sharing with the rest of Europe, and that relationship should, should continue, whether we're in the European Union or not. Uh, we had the Year of the Young People last year, which is a fantastic catalyst for getting young people engaged in all sorts of activity. Um, and those of us that, that have seen that, you, you know, though the Year of the Young People finished four months ago, that engagement with policymakers continues because they've seen the value in it. Um, we've got the, the Young Women's Leads Programme, which is a, a group of 25 uh, young women under 30 that are being invited into Hollywood monthly to tackle policy issues. Um, we've got the Children's Commission who went out to the the UN this week to give um, evidence on uh, the Committee for Torture and took two 18 year olds out and let them do the talking about what human rights means for young people as opposed to somebody else talking on their behalf. So you can see in Scotland we're starting to, 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 to do the right things but we've got a long way to go and I think and feel that Europe is a little, a little behind that um, in, in some senses and hopefully we can we can show how we've started things for the young people and that can help with this engagement with the future citizens of Europe and, and start to build back up the solidarity project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul.
for your contribution, to all our panelists for their contributions. Um, you've raised between you um, so many, so many issues, <laughs> um, which provides so many opportunities, hopefully, for people um, in the audience to share their own reflections and perhaps their own questions. Perhaps you came here today wanting an answer to something, or perhaps something that has been said um, in the last kind of half an hour has um, made you think or want to share your reflections. So, um, without further ado, could I ask you to raise your hand if you wish to ask a question or share a view or a, a fact? It's not a scary environment, so you don't have to feel that. <laughs> You can only raise your hand to say something clever. Okay, thank you. We've got a few hands coming up. So, Anthony, um, just at the front here, I think I saw something. If you could raise your hand again so Anthony can see you. Yeah. Thanks. Very uh, happy to you all and everybody in the audience, and particularly pleased that somebody who is half German and half Scottish to turn out at a meeting where a big part of the theme is Scotland's connection with Germany. Uh, Brexit has sucked so much air out of everything that it's not actually left that much room for, for other things. And so I'm really pleased to, to hear other things on, on the platform as well. But it seems to me one of the things that's, that's absent at the moment is what, what might we humbly learn from elsewhere? So Professor Keating talking about uh, federalism or quasi-federalism, quasi what can we learn from German federalism Scotland is on the trajectory that it's going. Uh, there are good examples, there are more challenging examples. I want to go along the table with a variety of issues that people were, were saying. So I'm trying not to hold my head in my hands and go, Brexit be schlecht, all it is really bad. Um, but what is it that we can be more optimistic about? We have some optimism at the end, which is great. But what, what more can we be learning from Germany, from elsewhere in Europe? Um, regardless of where we sit on the independence question. I think most people know what my views are on that. Thank you very much. Could you possibly just introduce yourself now that you've spoken? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, Angus Robertson, formerly the SNP Deputy Leader and Westminster Group Leader and now Managing Director of Progress Scotland, understanding how people are changing their views about Scotland's future. That sounds like an answer. That was a point. <laughs> <laughs> Please subscribe. <laughs> You can pay me later. Um, I think this lady here. Oh, sorry, I thought you would want to answer. No, no, if it's okay, we'll take oh, a few. All right. If we're all taking notes, as oh, right. Yeah, lovely. Obviously, we are hoping it, but just I look back and people obviously need a minute to get brave enough. Uh, Dr. Philippa Whitford, I'm the SNP health spokesperson uh, down at Westminster. And um, I really appreciated Michael's uh, speech about you know what's happening. You may say it's not the power grab, obviously, that's. The shorthand, but it's a real concern to me. We're celebrating 20 years of devolution. The current government, which is Conservative, never supported, Conservatives never supported devolution. There is this informal system, and 24 key areas of devolved competency are now going to have the, the ultimate power. Whether you think that, oh yeah, we need a UK framework, what the Scottish government asked for is that the framework should be agreed. What the big fight in Westminster was they said, no, we have the right to impose. And we're seeing it with the agriculture, um, that in the bill there'll be no direct subsidy to farmers. This could destroy hill farming, it could destroy the rural parts of Scotland, etc. And that really frightens me. And particularly as number 24, that everyone goes, I don't really know what that means, is public procurement which means suddenly the power would be in Westminster to simply say all public contracts have to be put out to tender, which is what they did to their own health service, and it would really frighten me to be done to ours. So I think we're not exploring the fact that we're all going, isn't it brilliant, 20 years of devolution, but that actually Brexit threatens to pull the whole heart out of the Parliament, and that we could actually end up a long way back Particularly, they've renamed the Scotland office the UK government in Scotland. There's talk about the replacements for European funds being direct between from Westminster. And that really, really frightens me because there have been lots of direct benefits to us as citizens from being able to. Thank you very much, Philip. I don't think there was a specific question in there, but I'm pretty sure <coughs> that the panel have kind of got some um, responses from that. From that. 
an um, excellent contribution from the floor, which has given time for possibly one other one. Oh, there was one, sorry, that you had your hand up first, the lady in the black there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Eva Klan, I'm a social researcher working for the Scottish Government, and that's right here. I'm, also, uh, I'm actually a full job, I'm not just half job. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering, uh, talking about kind of the, of the silver linings in this, um, uh, I was interested in hearing your views on whether you think um, Brexit can actually help the European Union address its challenges and can actually in the end maybe lead to further integration or whether you think that actually after Brexit has happened and whether we'll just go back to normal basically in the European Union as well or whether this whole process of uh, reformation maybe is coming to an end before it even has to be started. That's a really interesting uh, spin on, uh, on the issue. Thank you for that um, question. I think that's probably enough for the panel to be going with, but please, um, there, there is more chance for, for people to ask their questions shortly. So, um, Michael. Uh, yes, uh, to run through to answer this question there, what, what can we learn from elsewhere? I think we can learn from German federalism. It tends to be a more cooperative model, making policy together. The Welsh are very keen on that. Scotland less so. Uh, Canada, where the provinces have huge scope for making policy, it's a different model of federalism. I think we probably have more to learn from that. The way that Quebec has developed its own national project within the Canadian Federation, including an external dimension, uh, including its own welfare settlement. Spain and Belgium, where the nations and regions have negotiated a position whereby they have to be taken into account in the making of foreign policy, much more so in Belgium than in Spain. So yes, we have a lot to learn from them. On, on Philip's point, uh, yeah, when I said there wasn't a power grab, I don't think people in Westminster are going around wondering how to take bars back from Scotland, because they can do that any time. The problem is they don't think about us at all. That's the problem. It's just neglect. We'll do it this way. Hold on, you didn't think about the implications for devolution. And, and that, that is really problematic, because some of these things that now uh, just come in. Yes, this business about frameworks, everybody's agreed about frameworks, that doesn't mean they agree about what frameworks would involve. And some versions of frameworks is just consultation. That's not co-decision making. That's a different matter altogether. In the EU, we have a system of co-decision making in the Council of Ministers. We have majority voting. And again, the Welsh Government has got proposals. Why not have a UK Council of Ministers working that way? Because otherwise, uh, if Westminster can always get its way, always play the, the crown card, then you, you, you might as well just call it a consultation. This is a matter of power. But in the discussions we have around the UK government circles, the, nothing ever becomes a matter of principle. OK, so what's the problem with the nitrates directive? Uh, it's, not, it's not the nitrates directive. It's who decides. What, where these powers go. Not where they go, but who, who, who actually decides. And it's true that powers are being taken back in all sorts of ways. The Agriculture Bill, I read that, and several of us picked it up. There's a little clause in there that says that the UK minister, the English minister, in fact, that's his, 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 his English minister for agriculture in DEFRA, can interpret the WTO regulation in such a way as to control agricultural subsidies. And I thought, wow, you know, that, that is a big, a big power there. Uh, public procurement, the whole notion of the internal market is highly politicized. It's not a technical matter. Does it include public procurement? If it includes public procurement uh, uh, and we sign a free trade deal with the United States, does that mean US health companies have a right to bid for contracts in the Scottish health service? This, this came up with regard to the TTIP, the transatlantic uh, uh, relationship. So these things are really, are really important and you've got to get them right. And then as for funds, uh, they're not putting the funds through the Barnet formula, which at least would give Scotland what it already has and maybe cut it thereafter. Uh, they're setting up a whole series of separate funds, a shared prosperity fund, an agriculture fund. We've already got city deals. We've got all these little bits and pieces which are mechanisms for control. It doesn't make for good government. It doesn't make for accountability. And that seems to be what's going to be happening as, as, as a result of, of Brexit. So these large amounts of money will be, be wasted in, in, in programs that have more of a political purpose than, than a clear policy purpose. Thanks, Michael. Julia. On the question, what can we learn from German federalism? 
I'm a tiny bit hesitant to explain what we can learn from uh, German federalism in this situation, because I think everybody shares the feeling that in a formal atmosphere that we have in the political discussion in the UK right now, to get lessons from Germany would maybe not be conducive to, to a peaceful solution. <laughs> um, but I would also like to explain that uh, federalism in Germany has its own historical development. I and mean, Germany was never a centralized state uh, very, very, for very long um, before the World Wars. So there is a, is a history of decentralization in Germany in several regional centers that have developed over the centuries. And this is reflected in, in German federalism. And it doesn't go for the UK in the same way. After the war, federalism was also strengthened by the Allies as a way to keep Germany, let's say, manageable and not too, too assertive. And I must say that Germany has fared very well with this model of federalism, but it doesn't fit everybody. It's not one size fits, fits all, all federalism. So I would be a tiny bit hesitant. I would be even more hesitant now to, to, to react to Philippa's point, because I think that is really a discussion that has been done in the UK. But I think what I can say is that our history of uh, federalism and our experience with federalism uh, creates a great sympathy in Germany to the concerns that are being felt in Scotland. Uh, and we follow this discussion and, and of course we, we speak also to, to Scottish representatives about this. And, and, and this is a debate we, we follow with great interest. So. Yes. Um Lots of big, big issues and, and questions there. I think let, let me start with the Brexit end of it. I think, I think there has been and still is a sort of deep dishonesty in a lot of the pro-Brexit debate um, about keeping the union, the UK union, together. Um, I think it's deeply dishonest because there's never been any attempt by Brexiters to seriously address the fact that Scotland and Northern Ireland voted remain. Um, there's been that uh, minority Conservative government alliance with the DUP instead in the last two years and, and, and a lack of urgency, I would say, until very recently for, for sad reasons in trying to re-establish the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive. And, I actually wrote a paper a, a year ago with Katie Haywood, one of the best um, academics based in Belfast, on, on especially border aspects of Brexit. We were actually comparing issues around Brexit in Northern Ireland and Scotland, the two remain bits of the UK, because that hadn't, hadn't been done. And it, it, it was very interesting to tease out the differences as well as the similarities, but, but we certainly came to the conclusion that Brexit was basically apart from anything else, weakening the devolution settlement and, and involving centralization. Um, and I think, you know, Michael's talked a lot about the, the, the powers, there's what's actually going on in specific areas, but there's also the, the question of political goodwill. If, you know, and if you're trying to, if you're trying to let Brexit not damage the union, I'm not sure you can do that, the only way to do that would be, would be to remain, but if you're trying, you do then at least try and engage Seriously, um, you make your joint ministerial committees and other ways of consulting. You, you do that seriously. You don't just reject out of hand proposals to, to have a differentiated settlement in Scotland, Scotland staying in the single market. Now, I made my own criticisms of the feasibility of that proposal, but that, that's different to just refusing to engage. I think there's a strong case, for instance, you could involve at least part of migration policy to Scotland, but all of this was treated as entirely neuralgic or irrelevant or, or wrong um, in, in London. So, and, and of course, what we've seen over the, the backstop and the, and the complete stalemate over Brexit, people say Westminster has a Remain majority. I think until now, sadly, Westminster has had a Brexit majority, but the only good thing is they can't agree among the MPs what sort of Brexit they want, and that's why we still have a hope we may yet get to, to a people's vote. Because being here in the Northern Ireland, Ireland case, the excuse of avoiding the backstop, um, or not wanting the backstop because it differentiates Northern Ireland, is, it's an excuse because, of course, what it is is the extreme Brexiters don't want to custom to, you know, and, and so at least they're honest though on that bit of it that there is a customs union. 
in the backstop, whereas we have these bizarre Tory Labour talks about should there or should there not be a customs union in, in, the, in the political declaration of the future of the relationship, and there already is one, and, and, and yet the main thing I'm going to say there isn't one. Um, Christy, can I, can, I yeah. ask, can I ask you to address um, specifically Ava's question mm, about um, can Brexit free the European Union to do what it wants to do better or to address sure. some of the challenges that it's facing? Just briefly, sorry. To yes, no, it's a very good question. It's an important one. Um, people say that. On the, on the whole, I think it doesn't. You know, I, I think it's much more in the EU's interest that the UK is a relatively large European country, recovers from this political crisis and political implosion and starts playing a serious role in Europe again, whether it's on, you know, uh, the standoff between the US and Iran at the moment and the EU struggling to to stop that, that um, important agreement falling apart or on, or on a Green New Deal or on lots of other issues. And I also think, you know, we, we could have a whole other event on exactly why Brexit happened and why the vote happened. But I think the UK has had so many opt-outs, it's actually not helped the European debate here that we've on, been on the sidelines of, you know, of the migration crisis, crisis in inverted commas, you know, that, that, that's fed paranoia here, but we've not actually been a, a main player. So I think it would, it would be much better all around for the, for the UK and the EU and Germany if we stayed. But on the other hand, I suppose, you know, Brexit is a crisis especially of English identity. It's about, I'm not saying there's no divisions in Scotland over Brexit, but they're much deeper and unlikely to go on for years in England. And I think the fear in Brussels and elsewhere, and fair enough, is that what if we have a people's vote and it's 50.5% remain and we bring this very tortuous um, UK and English political crisis back in, back into the EU, so perhaps in that sense. Just one, one last comment, I mean, Angus asked for positives or learning from German federalism. You know, I was thinking about this a few few months ago, you know, what, what do we need to rebuild UK politics, you know, if, given the state it's in, and we think, well, you certainly you need, you need to modernise it, you know, so you need an elected second chamber, you need proportional representation, you need a serious form of federalism that includes English regions. And, and you, you, know, you don't have to get very far down that list to some people I said it to, you know, start laughing because we're clearly not remotely, you know, if we were at that point in British political discourse of saying how can we modernise our system, we wouldn't be in the crisis we're, we're in. So there's plenty of lessons about how we get the system to the point Right. There's nothing positive in that last point that you just made. Poor, <laughs> 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 poor, some uh, quick reflections if you wish. Uh, okay, I'll I'll try to keep this brief. Just um, most of the things have been covered. So um, just on the, the, the funding issue, um, talking particularly around the, the, the social sector. Um, about a third of our money comes through the European Social Fund at the moment. There is a shared prosperity fund. The Treasury funding ends. December next year, as yet there's no criteria, nobody, I, I think as many as one in five charities will be at risk of closing within a year of that if they don't sort it out. That's how bad it is. So, you know, it, it is a huge issue and particularly given, uh, you know, a lot of Scotland's problems at the moment around uh, trying to be tackled are around the, the, the focus on social policy, that will leave a huge void in Scotland. Yeah. And I see that as the biggest risk um, in the process at the moment, um, looking at it from my point of view in the, in the social sector. Um, try and bring some positives. Um, I guess from my point of view, um, you know, I, I'll try not to get drawn on politics. I try and not cast my views in public forums, but um, whatever your views on the constitutional issues, it just needs to get sorted because there are enough policy issues going on that, that are not getting the resources that they need. Um, so, you know, whether it ends up being, you know, UK government, federalism, independence, it just needs sorting because it's gone on long enough. Um, and whoever is looking after the policies for Scotland going forward, um, you know, it needs to be recognised that, that in some areas Scotland is different from other parts of the UK. Migration is a huge challenge for us and it's something that, you know, if nothing else, we need to pick a fight on that because we need people in Scotland. 
Um, so I, I, in a way, the constitutional thing is a distraction from the bigger thing, which is Scotland's got its own challenges, and someone, to, you know, we need to resolve these constitutional issues so we can look at the, the policy issues unique to Scotland and start making some progress on them. Um, and that's got to happen sooner rather than later, before all of this drags on, a fit for charities go out of business, the social issues fall off the cliff, and we're left here still talking about constitutional issues. Paul, thanks. Good point. Okay, back to the floor. Please, again, raise your hands quite high so I can see you. So I'll gather one, two, uh, three just now, and we'll see how far that gets us. So uh, the lady in there, black, <laughs> one of my students, so thank you for coming. <laughs> And I'm here by residence here from Berlin, so I'm actually the last one to enjoy this. It has been really great so far, but I want to um, make a little policy suggestion to the panel. And you talked about furthering the European integration, and you talked about how the youth is really positive about Europe because it was maybe the first generation that really felt the, of the impact of social policy that was EU wide. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask what do you think about lowering the vo voting age to 16? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll take the. Sorry, was the gentleman behind in the white shirt? Thank you. So, uh, I'm Christopher Humphrey. I uh, volunteer with the Red Cross Refugee Service and do various other things. Um, I put my hand up first when I was uh, after uh, two excellent elected representatives, or former elected representatives over there, uh, spoke to say something about unelected representatives, non elected representatives. And maybe this picks up a wee bit on uh, civil society and the youth representation, and also talking about the federal system. So I don't know whether anybody else here uh, was at an excellent Glasgow Centre for Population Health talk uh, five or six years ago at St Andrew's Church, um, where an Austrian federal civil servant talked about the um, the representative citizens assembly citizens. I can't remember what they called them, but. Um, and it made a huge impact on me just talking about the details of that and how they're chosen in a random way, so not elected, but randomly selected in a, a scientific way. Um, so, come to the, the point being, uh, there's been a lot of talk actually recently, hasn't there, about the system. Citizens' assemblies as a way of maybe resolving the Brexit issue. Um, but I wonder whether perhaps Paul particularly might want to make comments on the role that um, either young people's assemblies or groups, or we might learn from them, or we might learn from Austria or other parts of Europe in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Um, there was a, yeah, a gentleman just behind you, Anthony, in the black top. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, sorry, I'm hiding behind the pillar. So, um, my name is Jonathan Jones, and I'm the Director of External Relations at the University of Glasgow. So, it was really just in response to uh, one of Julia's queries at the beginning. Um, so, the university did uh, one, uh, a formal partnership with the University of uh, Lufthansa last year in terms of the Advanced Centre for European Studies. So, that has started. It's not to the same extent as uh, Oxford and Imperial yet. Uh, and my uh, other we do to try and develop some of these links and uh, lastly how can we surface some of those more because the general perception is that not a lot of that is actually happening um, so I think there's a, there's, a, there's a challenge for us there in terms of what can we do further to build on what we're doing already and how can we promote that and make that more widely known. Okay thank you Jonathan and um, I think just for now we'll get the panel to respond so they're quite um, quite pithy questions which was very well done. Um, so I'll start, start with you, Michael. Yeah, voting age at 16, we, we have votes at 16 in Scotland, uh, except for Westminster elections, and, and it, it's worked very well here. I see absolutely no reason at all not to, and, and it was passed unanimously in the Scottish Parliament after the experience of the referendum. Uh, on citizens' assemblies, yes, it's a very interesting experience in Ireland around that. I don't think you're going to get a citizens' assembly assembly on, on, on Brexit. I think there's too much polarisation. Had David Cameron had the idea of setting one up before he launched this whole thing, we might have, have, have got somewhere. There's also talk about a citizens' assembly to get a constitution for the UK. I'm profoundly sceptical because there's so much difference there. You can't even get the Northern Ireland parties <coughs> together. How can you get the whole of the UK together? Within Scotland, yes. I think there's, 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 that's, that's an idea that's 
really worth exploring there in England, in parts of England, the regions of England, Wales, and so on. I, I think that's, that's, that's really quite an exciting uh, uh, idea. Of course, ultimately, politicians will decide, elected politicians will decide, but they've reframed the issue. Um, the final question uh, yeah. uh, uh, about education exchange. I, I was for 10 years a professor at the European University Institute in Florence, uh, a wonderful place. Uh, there are a disproportionate number of Scots students in the British contingent there, lots of Irish students do. Last month, the UK government introduced a subtle instrument in Westminster to withdraw from the EUI, and apparently this wasn't even necessary. It's not even a European institution. I mean, it's just shocking <laughs> that some civil servants thought, well, we better pull out of that one as well. Uh, and as it was, the British government wasn't making this, uh, the, the contribution to it that, that, that it should have been was paying the money. Scotland was actually, the Scottish government was much more, more positive. But that, those are things that are just, are just totally unnecessary there. Uh, and because, of course, educational exchanges, whether it's students, undergraduate researchers, and so on, are critically important. And if we lose those, we're, we're really in trouble. Thanks. Julia? Yes, maybe on, on the same point of cooperation between university schools and so on. Um, I think the uh, German institutions in the UK, together with the embassy, have created a really good network that might be helpful in that respect. Um, and it's a network of journalists, uh, universities, together with the Goethe Institute, uh, German Academic Exchange Service, so maybe the easiest thing would be to get in contact or we, we talk afterwards and we can discuss a little bit how we can, how we can maybe further that network and, and include more Scottish institutions in that. And if I may, can I just come back to the question mm -hmm. you asked on, on can Brexit help the EU to, uh, to address the challenges of the future? And I can only say Brexit doesn't help with anything. And uh, I think we wouldn't have needed Brexit to, to become aware that we need to tackle these challenges. The EU has had several wake-up calls apart from Brexit. Uh, the crisis in the last years, the, the debt crisis, financial crisis, so-called migration crisis. We wouldn't have needed Brexit to remind us that uh, some reform and strategic thinking would be so necessary. And also, it will be so much more difficult to tell, tackle these challenges without, without the UK and the European Union. Yeah. Because sometimes you get the impression from, from the point of view of the UK that the UK was kind of a reluctant bystander in the European Union. They weren't. They, they shaped every decision that was made in the European Union and they, they really contributed a lot. So every, Every possible challenge that we meet will be harder to solve without the UK, so it, it, it doesn't help. And the question, do we go back to normal after Brexit? I don't think so, because these challenges are, are there and they don't go away. And we just had our regional ambassadors conference on, on Europe in Berlin with all the ambassadors from all the European countries. And in the past two years, this meeting focused, I wouldn't say exclusively, but almost exclusively on Brexit. And now the focus is shifting again, also because we're waiting to, to see what happens, but the focus is shifting to address these questions that, uh, that deal with the future of the, of the European Union. And we know we have, to, we have to address these in the future, so I don't think there's a danger of going back to normal. Thank you. Kirsty. Thank you. Um, I think, yes, I, I agree with uh, taking the voting age down to 16 seems to me a, a, a really positive, positive idea and we're trying to sort of create new dynamism in our democracy and democracies across Europe. Um, that, that seems to be one, one part of many other things we, we could and probably should be doing. Um, citizens' assemblies are, are, are suddenly the flavour of, of the month, um, but I think they're very interesting because, because they're about some of the things you know, Paul's been talking about. How, how do you help younger people, civil society, non-elected representatives, how do we get more of a role in shaping and, and designing policy? And I don't think they're not a panacea, but we've suggested two things in our, in our report. Firstly, that there should be a citizens' assembly in Scotland on European issues, um, exactly how you set that up, given where we are with Brexit, you know, is an open question. But I suppose, in a sense, you know, what we've, as I said, tried to do in our report is say, look, here's all these different issues that matter. Some may be in a crisis state, some may be in a more positive state. 
but we're already part of that as Scotland. We have lots to add. Where do we want it to go next? Um, so, so I think. I think there's that, but we also suggest in the report, and I think it'd be quite tricky to do, but very interesting, we suggest the European Union should think of having a citizens' assembly. Because the European Union tries to have communication, tries to have dialogues, or in France, President Macron has tried to have citizens' dialogues, and all, all this is good as far as it goes. But I have to say, I rather like the idea in terms of resisting um, it's not fair to say Brussels is centralised when it has actually so few officials compared to a member state government. Um, but you know, if we were a citizens' assembly of randomly chosen EU citizens, and then we had experts would come and talk to us, or some of the Commission or Council officials or the MEPs would come and tell us their point of view, it reverses the normal presumption. You know, otherwise, if we're the, the EU people and you come and tell us your views, and we go away and do something with them or not. So I, I think that kind of reversal it doesn't only have to happen in a citizens' assembly, but it's a way of rethinking how, how our democratic processes. Um, work. And, and there's some other more specific suggestions um, in our report for things Scotland might do, and my colleague Anthony Salmoni is kindly um, passing the microphone around at the moment, but he, he's put some interesting suggestions in there, and taking an example of Ireland, not just Germany, in terms of Ireland has carried out so-called bilateral audits of its relationships with particular countries, and it did that particularly effectively about Ireland's relationship with Germany, and then adjusted its policy as a result, and so again, that's a rather nice example of whether Brexit happens or not. It will be a rather different exercise, but in either scenario, it's still something worth doing. Let's go see Paul. Thank you. Uh, I won't go to the voting agent, you can cut it. Um, you know, I hope Westminster follows the lead that's made in the Scottish Government. I doubt it will, because it doesn't necessarily politically suit the current government to do so, to open up the voting age to 16, 17 year olds, so I suspect it probably won't happen. Um, great that you're on investments. Um, if that deal went through, you would have. The good news would have been you would have still got access to Erasmus support, and the bad news would be you don't have to deal with our home office. Um, but hopefully, um, whatever happens with Brexit, things like you know, the, I, there is a, a, a huge lobby going on between universities and the sector about Erasmus in particular, and ensuring that you know whatever happens with Brexit, that that program. Uh, is something that the UK continues to participate in um, because it, it is a fantastic program. Um, and I think in terms of the sort of engagement issue and the promotion point, they're, um, they're all linked, right? So we were talking about this earlier about populism and, and the macro message and all of these things, but you know, promoting is fine, but you're still <coughs> then promoting to people that are outside of the tent, and it's much easier to enrage people that are outside the tent than it is to promote to them. So you've got to find a way of bringing them into the tent, and uh, you know that, that's where I think whether it's citizens' assemblies or other things, got, you know, people have to feel engaged. And I'll give you a couple of really simple examples that have nothing to do with this. But we, we changed our service at Project Scotland about three years ago, where we just basically invite young people in every month and say, to just tell us one thing we could have done differently that made it different to your experience and it you know yes we're doing brilliant social things for young people but we've made some really small changes that they're so proud of and it's made made a difference in the engagement and so it's simple things like we put a phone number on our website and we go, I don't use my phone the only person I talk to on the phone is my mum and so when she calls me you know I'll, I'll, I'll text you so can I text the number and I'm like, oh, God, we never thought about that so Often it's the really simple changes in how you can engage young people in communications that we're missing out on because we're too busy dealing with the macro messages and we forget that we've got to find a way of actually talking to them. Um, so, you know, if nothing else as, as, as Scotland and, and Europe embarks on engaging in citizens, the first thing they have to do is to learn how to listen to people. Um, and that involves understanding how they communicate and, and going into their spaces, um, whether that's citizens assembly or anything else. And then we can get the message and start promoting that there's no point putting messages out there if no one's reading them. Here's a challenge to you. Who's got a pithy question to finish with? Okay, maybe one other. <coughs> one other pithy. Okay, think pithy. Okay, uh, the gentleman here. Right. Um, Angus Robertson suggested at the past that we. Sorry, Angus Robertson. Uh, okay. Angus Robertson asked what we could learn from. I think he talked about German friends and the German from Europe. Is the big lesson not that national sovereignty is not an absolute good, and sometimes it has to be traded for the pragmatic benefits of cooperation? 
And is it not time that the public will level with that fact that people have the courage to tell them? Okay, thank you. That was pithy. Well done. The lady here, please. Hi, I hope this is going to be the end of the question. Um, we're part, some of us here are part of a group and we talk to people on the streets and much as we love coming to these um, very academic and cerebral talks, um, it doesn't get across to a lot of people on the streets, so I'd like a short phrase or sentence that can appeal to the hearts rather than the minds of people when we talk to them on the streets about Europe and, and so on. Thank you. Okay, the challenge back to the panel to be pithy. Thank you. Michael. Quick answer to the first one is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and sovereignty is just a, it's a, it's a gibbler. It's just, it's just a word. It's a, it's a meaningless word because it's what we discovered from Brexit. Okay, we'll leave, we'll take back control. What's the next thing we do? Start negotiating. Not only with the EU, but with the United States and, 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 and so on. And even if you look at the withdrawal agreement, the mechanisms that are put in place to conduct our future relations with the EU involve binding arbitration now, the, with, without even a voting mechanism. I mean, that's not a loss of sovereignty. What is? And, and you're going to negotiate with the likes of, of, of Trump. I mean, that, 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 this, is real, this is real hard politics there. Uh, so I, I, absolutely, and I've been saying that all my, my, my adult life, so yes. <laughs> Appealing to the hearts, I'm no good at that. But, uh, <laughs> people, uh, what, 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 what really is struck to me is it's, it's people of my generation who voted overwhelmingly to leave. And when I was growing up, the notion of Europe was about peace. It was about the memory of war. And that wasn't so long ago. And that's, that's just it. People have just backed that and they've forgotten about it. Uh, and even though there are wars going on all around us, and there's always some peace in here. And people are so unaware of the contribution to peace and stability that's been made by the European project. That tugs on my heartstrings, my form. Yeah. Uh, Yulia. Yeah, I think I would also agree to that lesson being drawn from German federalism, but I think we also have to acknowledge the fact that people are attached to their national sovereignty. So if you talk about people's hearts, I mean, you also have to take that into consideration, but then maybe explain to them that. Uh, in today's globalized world, giving up sovereignty to a certain degree adds to your strength and, and your sovereignty. And I think that is the experience we have had in the European Union. And I think that is a lesson that has permeated in, in Germany, and I hope that it will be possible to spread that message also. Um, and a pithy sentence that goes to the heart. <laughs> I think we, we, a concern we have is that Brexit might, co might contribute to our losing interest in each other. Right? So that we might lose interest in our neighbors between uh, the UK and Germany. And I think we should really fight that. We should not let Brexit uh, make this happen. So let's prevent Brexit from damaging interest in our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think, um, I mean, in a sense, the, the word that comes to me, out of both questions, is, is the word common. You know, we live in a common world, and we also live in a, we, uh, we should aim to be in a, in a common Europe, or to create a common Europe. And if, if we're creating a divided, or allowing a divided Europe to fester, or inequality and poverty to fester, that, that's not, you know, that's not going to, to bring us together. So uh, no, I no, I like the rest of the panel. It's a very good question, and I don't have a, a, an instant. Uh, be rash to say I have an instant, an instant answer. Um, I'm not really, really coming to the end here, so I should segue off into talking about the euro crisis. Um, but how that, and, uh, how that was dealt with, and in terms, you know, how Greek society survived, but is it sort of being warped and damaged? You know, so I think it's too trite to say we want a Europe that cares, but we do want a European society and politics that is for the common good and cares, and that's that's what we should aim for. And we certainly don't get to that by rejecting it and going for our own solutions. Uh, okay, I'll maybe just tackle the second question then, because the subject one's been. I, I wouldn't make a statement at all. I would 
stop making statements and start asking questions. It's the single biggest thing that we can do for people that don't is just ask them, well, what's, the big, what's the one thing we could do to make your life better? What's the one thing we can do to make you happier? What's the one thing that's worrying you? What's your perceptions of you? Let's listen and find out why people feel the way they do. Um, and then we can start to act on that. Um, there's a huge amount of assumptions out there about why people voted the way they did. Most of it is nonsense. Um, because they've not actually taken the time to sit down and listen to people. Um, so that, that would be my message. If there's, there's one line on the out there, that we, we need to start listening, not, not making statements, and, and then hopefully we can start to turn this around over, over time. What a great way to finish. Thank you for, thank you for that um, question, and thank you for the, the thoughtful and humane answers. Um, I um, would like to invite everybody here to join us for a drink and a further blether. You can be as unpithy as you like over there. Thank you so much for your, um, for your questions, for, for coming, but also um, it's lovely to have an informed audience. And um, I don't think it's been too intellectual and cerebral. I think it's been hopefully really accessible. And thank you again to the Adenauer Foundation and the Scottish Centre European research for, for bringing um, this together and um, can we say thank you once again to us.
We are at a special event today, and uh, I'm going to let Kirsty tell you exactly what it is. Uh, I run a Scottish EU think tank called the Scottish Centre on European Relations, and we've put on this joint Scottish German event on Europe Day to think about the challenges facing Europe and look at Europe's future and what contribution Scotland can and should make to that future. Well, that sounds very fascinating to me. Um, so you're dealing with all the countries in the European Union? Yes, when we, when we say where is Europe going next, we're looking at all the 28 we haven't left yet. We may not leave, hopefully, in terms of the UK and Brexit. So we're saying... What can we do together? What are the problems? We're facing climate change, we're facing different views on migration and how Europe welcomes or rejects asylum seekers. We're looking at the economy, poverty, inequality. What's the best way to tackle these issues together? What's the best way to push back against right-wing populism in Europe? How, how can we make something positive out of the upcoming European Parliament elections? And Scotland is not a state at the moment, is not a member state of the EU, but it's part of the EU, it's a country in the EU, it's got lots to say about human rights, about doing more on economic and social rights, or about doing more on climate change, or how you include young people in designing policy, not just debating policy. So there's lots of countries in the EU, there's lots of regions in the EU, but we all have a role and ideas and interests that we can contribute. So we've been trying to take the big picture and link it to Scotland's particular contribution and how it can engage with all the other countries. And of course, you, you can't actually pick Scotland up and move it any more than you can move Denmark or Sweden or Germany. And Germany was the main focus of this uh, meeting we've had today. And of course, if Brexit happens or if it doesn't happen, we are still geographically neighbours and we have to find some way but how will we find some sort of pathway some sort of link if we haven't got the structure of the European Union with us? I think it's certainly the case yes we are European and we will stay European whatever happens with Brexit but if Brexit goes ahead it will depend on what basis it goes ahead it, it won't make it any easier but it will actually make it more important that we find ways to maintain or build or rebuild networks to think how we can have influence even though we'll have less influence from the outside but when you talk to people in Scotland there are so many rich networks you can talk to musicians or people doing cultural things you can talk to NGOs dealing with inequality or poverty or young people you can talk to academics and universities you can talk to business there's all sorts of existing networks Networks and partnerships, it's, it's really encouraging. And a lot of those groups, they're not looking forward to Brexit, but they've certainly looked at how they can maintain those sorts of links and networks. And I think the Scottish Government has done quite a bit to be ready to keep networks and interests going in Europe. And our, our only suggestion to them is that despite Brexit, sucking up so much energy is to look at a more coherent way of having a, a so-called soft diplomatic strategy, you know, how, how to promote which interests and which goals as priorities and how to do it whether we're in the EU or outside the EU. Yeah, I mean, to, to my mind, one of the biggest problems with the Brexit is that no one offers us a, a, an, an alternative. No one has come up with an alternative to the EU. And I suppose that's really what you're trying to say. You're trying to say, well, look, OK, if we have to do it this way, let's find a, a, a structure and a way forward without the structures we've already spent 70 years building. Is that correct? I think that's not, I think that's not what we're saying. And no. I'm certainly still hoping and arguing that the whole UK should remain in the EU. And I think if the UK leaves the European Union, that will put the independence discussion and choice in a much sharper light does if brexit happens does scotland want to accept that or does it want to be an independent country in the in the european union so what we've not done in our new report or in these events today we've not tried to say how to handle brexit on the contrary we've said what are the big questions issues lots of them problems but some opportunities facing all of us today in europe what are what should we be doing as europe and what can Scotland contribute to that? Hopefully it will contribute what it can from within the EU, but that even outside 
it can contribute. But we certainly are not yet in a position to say what's the details of a Scottish strategy for once Brexit happens. And in fact, I've been trying not to do that because I'm busy arguing and working with lots of other people to have a people's vote and to get us to remain in the EU. Well, I think that's very kind of you to speak to me and to speak to our viewers in Broadcasting Scotland. I won't take any more of your time because I'm sure you've got other folks that you need to speak to. But thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Very kind for of you. Me and for filming our event. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I? Oh, I didn't know I was live. I'm just standing here wondering. Anyway, this, this um, meeting we're at today is a, a particular meeting that is um, uh, of, a, of a group of people who've brought out a report. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group of essays talking about the different links that uh, Scotland can maintain, specifically with Germany. And the audience was well attended, and luckily I'm going to be able to speak to Angus Robertson now, who used to be uh, the leader of the SMP group in Westminster, and is now the chairman of Progress. I am the director of Progress Scotland, which is a, mark, a, a research company uh, which is trying to better understand uh, people who are changing their views in Scotland, largely because of what's going on with Brexit, but there are other issues as well. Uh, I'm trying to understand what is making people think uh, in a new way about our future in Scotland uh, and uh, how and when uh, we should... Um, uh, I think primarily the question is about Scotland and, and a further independence referendum and how will people vote in that. Um, but I'm really interested, which I think this event... Um, was a contribution towards to try and imagine a future Europe, try and imagine a future Scotland, and how might that be, and how might we fit in, and what can we offer elsewhere, but also what can we learn from other countries uh, as well. And that's what really interests me, because I'm in the business of trying to understand who does what really well, and it was a really good idea, um, and it might work here, let's use it. And also in the things that we've done that are groundbreaking, let's help our friends and neighbours on these islands, on the European continent, say when we've done good things, um, here's how we did it, and if it works for you, you might think about doing it yourself. Yeah, and indeed you asked the question of the panel about what we might be able to learn from the federalism that exists already in Germany. What did you gain from what the answers the, the panel gave? Well, I think with these sort of things, obviously people are reluctant to say there's a direct read across uh, because there's a federal system in Austria or there's an asymmetric devolution system in, in uh, Spain or because Belgium has its own arrangements, uh, that, that one of these might be a good fit for Scotland. I'm actually thinking in a slightly different way of uh, after we become independent, because I, I think it's coming, um, more than 60% of people in our polling, whether they would like Scotland to be independent or not, believe Scotland will become independent. So I think, in a way, we almost need to think like a state and act like a state. So having the power to make decisions closer to home, what would the better decisions be? And when it comes to governance, I think there are some really positive lessons that we can learn from European countries, including Germany, about how do we include local government, the locality, in national decision-making and in European and international decision-making. They do that via their federal system. Uh, so the different lender, the different regions of Germany are involved in the upper house of the German uh, parliament and through that uh, they are able to take part in, in making decisions that impact on them at a local level through their national parliament to what's going on on a European and international level. And I think there's a massive relevance for people, it doesn't matter where you live, from, uh, from the, the, the far north uh, to the south of the country, east to west, I think 
uh, being more involved, and that was another part of the discussion that was, was held this evening about getting people involved in things. How do we find the best mechanisms uh, for Scotland in the 21st century that makes sure that everybody has a part in the democratic process and in the way that the country is governed, that it, it involves everybody in, in being involved in reaching the best decisions locally, nationally and, and internationally. Yes, I mean, I've always been fascinated when you look at, um, well, I, I, I lived in Switzerland for a long time, so their form of government comes right down to your own town where there's a, a mayor and a, and a, a the burgers or whatever, uh, and, and you can make a law for your own town, and people feel very, very engaged with that. And of course, if you are a normal citizen, your life is really generally fairly small you, in, in, in the sense of an area. You might live here, and your Wayne's go to school over here, and you go to work over here. You might go and see Aunt Molly, who lives in three, three stations of, of, away from you, and occasionally you go to Spain on holiday. But your world is small. So how do we make it really relevant to the normal everyday citizen who can feel that I have an influence over where I stay. I, I don't think there's a single fix to any of these things but I think one of the exciting prospects about Scotland becoming independent is that we can dare to imagine the different ways and we might in, in the, we might be able to answer that question and it's not because we are Scotland that we will find the best answer, but surely there is a logic to saying if we understand the needs, interests, concerns and expectations of people here in this country, uh, who's best qualified to perhaps come up with the answer to the needs, interests, concerns and expectations of people in this country than people in this country. And whether we um, uh, are able to build up the best governmental structures, formal governmental structures, but then have innovative ideas involving the likes of citizens' assemblies, uh, and also the full gamut of uh, charitable and third sector and other organizations that, that play a role in our society in one way or another. I think one of the advantages of being a country the size of Scotland of, as five million, you mentioned Switzerland, but there are other similar size countries, and I think because you are a smaller country and you are not far away from anybody, whether it's your Aunt Molly or uh, whoever, uh, I, I think you have a better opportunity through formal and informal ways of getting the right answers to the questions that face us. But I think what we've learned from the whole Brexit stuff is uh, until you have an ambition to make things better, you actually have a plan to make things better, um, uh, we should learn the lesson and not follow what's been going on um, down south with um, mm. the na national debate there. We, we need to build something much better than that here. We have the opportunity to do it. We have a, a government um, in Holyrood that has a mandate uh, for us all to have a say in our future, and I, I look forward to being able to exercise that. Yeah. Can I just bring you, just to finish off, one wonderful sentence you just gave us uh, back a, a, a few moments ago. And you said the polling suggests that 60% of people think that there will be an independent Scotland. Maybe they're not supporters of that, but yep. just do that, do that one again. I, I, I'd not heard it in that way before. Well, in Pro Progress Scotland is uh, doing a rolling series of polls where we're asking people's opinions about things. And we're primarily interested in people who are open-minded, who are not yet decided. But we did ask some questions right across the piece about what did people think uh, could happen, should happen, might happen. And on uh, people, does one believe that Scotland will become an independent country, regardless of whether you're for that or not? It was actually more than 60%. And I would say to your viewers that if you're interested in, in the results that we have, please visit the Progress Scotland website, www.progressscotland.org, um, and you can have a look at all of the research there. If people are interested in that, please use it. There's some great videos that we've got on it. If people want to support the work that we're doing, please take out a subscription. It's, it's through people's, you know, two, two pounds a month, five pounds a month, 10 pounds a month, if they are feeling very generous, that we are able to pay for this polling, pay for this focus group work, and we're very grateful for that. So so thank you very much. Thank you, Angus. It's very lovely to thank speak you. to you. Thank and you thank you for much. giving me your thank time. You. Not at all. Bye-bye. So, that Angus Robinson, I, I, I don't know um, about you, but I, I, I'm, I, I do enjoy watching uh, uh, Ian Blackford down in Westminster. But I also miss very much Angus and, and, and his uh, way of doing things down there. And now I've got a nice gentleman in a very smart suit and a lovely tie. Thank and. You very uh, much. <laughs>
It's the first time we've met, it's the first time we spoke, and I only caught you speaking and I didn't hear the introductions. Right. So I don't actually know who you are. I'm Lewis. Who are you? I'm Felix. I'm the director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation uh, in the UK and Ireland. The Konrad Adenauer Foundation is a political think tank from Germany. It's a political foundation uh, affiliated to the conservatives in Germany, the Christian Democrats, um, but we're fully independent at the same time. So it's a it's a very unique German construct, and we have offices all around the world, uh, serve a bit as a think tank, as a networking platform between um, Germany and the host country where we operate in, and we have about 90 offices around the world. And just to Disem, how do they say that when they you look at Wikipedia and they give you a list of things to disambiguation or I can't think of the word I, I, I often lose the word I'm looking for and that doesn't help because you're a native German speaker but a very fine English speaker too but that word conservative can we just uh, unpick that a little bit and compare it so that people in Scotland will understand the differences between what we would call a conservative uh, from the English political system and also from the Scottish political system and your system in Germany? Of course, that's a, that's a very valid question. Of course, conservative means something entirely different in, in the country you look at. Um, so conservative in Germany means Christian democratic, center-right, uh, nothing to the extremes, means basically absolutely pro-European and committed to the European project, means, uh, means all sorts of other issues related to the single market, to, the, to a strong strong Europe which, is, uh, which gives us the framework of peace, stability and prosperity within the European Union. That is where we stand and therefore we find Brexit an entirely disastrous uh, process happening um, both to the UK but also to Germany and in particular the European Union as a whole. Yeah. If the worst, uh, I've got to be careful what I say because I, you know, I do often wear my colours on my sleeve when possibly <laughs> I should be the neutral person here because I'm the you know the guy who's doing the interview <laughs> but if this Brexit does finally come to conclusion and I find it very difficult to understand where it can go uh, for lots of different reasons which we could sit down and discuss for a long time the idea of this meeting today was to see how we can maintain our links between Scotland and Germany which you pointed out earlier on were very very important to both Germany and Scotland so what kind of strands are we going to be able to pick up on here? Are there some nuggets we can give to our, our audience out, out there? Definitely. I think uh, on, a, on a bilateral um, level, there's so much you can do, whether you're inside of the European Union and outside of the European Union, or even if they are both inside of the European Union, you can always strengthen bilateral ties. You can do it through academic exchanges. You can do it through uh, school exchanges to start at a very early level to, to strengthen the mutual understanding of one another. Um, you can do it through political exchanges. Um, you can do it through all sorts of other um, business platforms. Uh, uh, try to uh, facilitate joint businesses or research projects um, on a larger scale. I think there are numerous ways um, how to do that and uh, tourism is another way of, uh, of engaging the people directly with one another and I think there's, there are endless possibilities. You just need to start to sit at a table and get it done. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're most welcome. Tip top, they would say, in Switzerland, where I stayed for many, many years. And uh, thank, you. thank you for your contribution to our program tonight, and thank you for the speech you gave earlier on to the audience here. You're Very welcome. kind to talk to me. Thank you. So it's, uh, it's been a, you know, I, I often I, 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 you know, I stumble over what I should say to you out there, because obviously I do speak a little bit too much and a bit too freely. But when you meet such charming people, it's difficult. Now, I've got another charming person, I hope, to speak to in a minute. It's Philippa's becoming my friend, I hope. It's <laughs> lovely to again. see you. <laughs> How are you feeling? Uh, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's been a really interesting event. Tell me what you got from it. Um, well, I think it was good to hear a range of 
kind of backgrounds, particularly Paul's talk about civic society, uh, talking about citizens' assemblies. You know, this is a challenge, I think, for all governments. And, of course, at our recent conference, uh, the SNP have talked about having a citizens' assembly to find a way forward for Scotland constitutionally, but looking over at Ireland, how they resolve what were very thorny issues for them. And I think that what I would hope is that once we've used that process, once we might actually look, how would that fit in our democracy? Because it's fine trying to get powers to Scotland, trying to get Scotland independent, but how do we get more people involved and how do we get more young people involved? And I thought that was very interesting and particularly what Paul was talking about, finding mechanisms that allow you to listen, to hear. I think the Scottish Parliament is very good because it has its petition system which Westminster has now taken on. I spoke in the very first petition debate in Westminster, but it then doesn't tend to go anywhere right. after that. So, you know, how do you actually empower citizens? And maybe that then would be something that Europe might look at, mm -hmm. because people talk about Europe being distant, being far away. We need to make people realize, actually, we're part of Europe. Mm -hmm. and we have a vested interest in Europe, we have a contribution to make and we have a voice in it. And obviously that's why I would like to see Scotland independent in the EU, so actually at the top table, shaping things, discussing things and having a vote on things. Yeah, I was interested in Paul too because he was trying to engage the young people and it was a simple matter of putting a, a telephone number on their website so that people could actually call them up. Well, no, it was to change from a telephone number. Oh, was it? I they, your partner no, no, misunderstood. They, yeah. No, they had a telephone number, but when they got the young people in to consult, they said, we don't phone. The only person who phones me is my See, mom. I'm old-fashioned, yeah, you, you see. see. <laughs> you made exactly their mistake. What he was saying is we text. So if you have a landline, you can't text to that. So if you want a phone number, put a mobile number that they could text or WhatsApp or contact in some other way so you know if you're going to have a dialogue you need to understand how the younger generation actually talk to each other yeah, i'm glad you're in westminster and not me <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it's just having a 25 year old son so i know how these things work and for me i always jump in at these things i didn't know what i was coming to tonight so you know, i'm trying to catch up wondering what the dick is everybody's talking about but um i do think it's fascinating the way that this new internet world exists because if you think about that Facebook thing and, and the Twitter to a less extent because it doesn't have so many members it is a world in its own isn't it you know is it two or three billion folk on the on the on the on the Facebook and people can chatter with anybody they like anywhere and it kind of it's outside all the other other things and I suppose people are trying to bring it back inside I don't know what do you feel about those well I, I think Facebook is a very good tool I mean obviously it's been really important to us as believers in independence and in 2014 because we needed an alternative media because we couldn't get through the barrier of the media that said unfortunately Facebook now has such a grip of everything that while you think you can talk to anyone in the world they're using algorithms and uh, you know AI to direct people to you or if you're not doing enough of certain things to direct people away from you so unfortunately Facebook isn't as free as it used to be um, and the way we're advertised to the way our data is collected you know there's lots of people switching off from Facebook it was if you like the disruptor but now it looks to many people like it becomes part of the establishment, it becomes about the profit motive, and it isn't as free as it was. And have you any concerns about it and its advertising, all those terrible stories of Cambridge Analytica in the last debacle of an election, but we're coming up to something that could be very in, uh, send a very important message from Scottish people uh, in the 23rd of May in the elections there. Well, I think obviously the scandal of Cambridge Analytica shows us that you can't have, uh, whether it's new media or whether it's the internet or these uh, platforms, completely outside regulation. And, you know, Facebook, that data was collected from Facebook. It was collected dishonestly. And Facebook wanted to hide it because they were trying to protect their reputation rather than actually coming forward and saying, we need to solve this. And, you know, the thing is, you've got 25 pages of terms and conditions to take to use any of these tools and people kind of go, yeah, 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 fine, I agree. And what they don't always realize is what they're agreeing to. 
and I think that we do need a change. And obviously what we have had recently at Westminster is that they were having meetings with all of these platforms about the issue of suicide and self-harm and the anti-vaccine messages and different things that are, that are on uh, these platforms, including promotion of terrorism, other things, hate speech, etc. And, and making them take some responsibility for what is there. You can't just have an entire system that comes into everybody's house and onto everybody's phone where there's no rules at all. Yeah. This is not just going out, it's coming into you, isn't it? Yeah. And just before we, I'll let you go because I'm sure I've taken a lot of your time and I always not get this, so. I always get this sort of anxiousness that these poor people want to go and talk to somebody else, not just me. But um, the uh, meeting that we've had today and if there is a, a situation where we actually do leave the European Union, the importance of Scotland's relationship with Germany. A little word on that? Well, 68% of all German tourists who come to the UK actually come to Scotland. So what Julia Gross said is absolutely true. Uh, Dusseldorf has a Scottish folk music festival. Uh, there is an absolute romantic connection to Scotland. And I think it's really important to preserve that. But I'm sorry, I don't think we should be so supine. Um, obviously, I'm part of the cross-party groups working to find ways of stopping Brexit if we can. But I, of course, believe that Brexit shows why Scotland should be making its own decisions in the future. And I see Scotland's future back in Europe. And I don't think that we should just accept it and put a few sticking plasters on trying to deal with what will be a terrible impact on Scotland. Thank you very much, Philip Whitford. It's very kind of you you're to welcome. take the time to talk to us. See you again next time, I hope, okay. if you'll talk to me again. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Love you. Bye-bye. So, I think that we've given you a, a flavour of this uh, meeting here today. I hope you've in, enjoyed it and been uh, had your, your brain stretched a little bit, as mine has been. And uh, we'll see you uh, again on uh, Broadcasting Scotland as soon as we've got another programme for you. Good night to you. Bye-bye. <laughs>